Um, that was awesome hearing about Marianne and, and robotics and all that sort of thing. I've got plenty of question now. Um, so um, I want to start. So here's what I want to do with this talk. I want to share a way of viewing AI and how can we actually use that view to use it for real, real world problem. And I actually want to start with a quote from uh, Pedro Domingo. He's a, he's a professor of, of computer science, um, and he's, he did a bit of work on, on AI. And he says, people worry that computer will get too smart and take over the world, but the real problem is that they're too stupid and they have already took over the world. And so, <laughs> and so if you think about it, if you think about energy, you know, water distribution, communication, education, you know, all those industries are somehow connected to the computer. Right, and, and, and trust me, the computer at that, that stage is very stupid. Like, there's no way you can actually have a computer to learn from existing experience and adapt to it, so it's kind of very stupid. Um, the word problem is probably not the word that I would use, but anyway. Um, so I'm gonna start by trying introducing myself quickly. So I'm, I'm Hugo, I'm one of the co-founders here at um, DSTEC. Uh, I would define myself as an entrepreneur. I've made uh, many different startup. Um, I've been working with AI technology for about six, five years now. Um, I have a background as a business analyst, um, and um, that's that's me. Um, so what I what I, what I want to start with is something that you probably guys uh, actually to start with. So I want to just get a feel of the audience here. So is there is there some entrepreneur in in the room here? Show hand, entrepreneur. Cool. Um, cool. Government worker, people who are working for the government. Yeah. What else? What do we have? Teach academic? Right. Okay. All right. Um, so, okay. So, I'm going to start with something that you guys probably have heard of, which is AlphaGo. So, anyone heard about AlphaGo in the room? Yeah. Okay, good. So, for those of you who don't know, AlphaGo is an AI software that's been built by the company called DeepMind. And the goal of AlphaGo was to actually play the game of Go. Um, and they've succeeded. So they've built that software, the software learned how to play the game, and it turns out that the, the, the software beat the world's best champion at the game, four to one, right? So they played five game, the software won four time, and then the, the human actually won just only one time. But after AlphaGo, what, they, what DeepMind did is that they did another software called um, AlphaGo Zero, and I'm gonna move, because I like to move. Um, and so, so the goal of AlphaGo Zero was to play against AlphaGo, right? And they've also succeeded. So they've built that AI um, software, and then they've managed to actually um, um, have very good performance. And there's two very important things about AlphaGo Zero. The first one is that AlphaGo Zero beat AlphaGo, not four to one, not nine to one, but 100 to zero, right? So out of 100 game, Alpha goes zero one 100% of the time. The second very important thing to understand about Alpha goes zero is that DeepMind train, like Marianne mentioned, that algorithm with, with what's called reinforcement learning, which is a part of deep learning. They've trained that software and managed to have that performance in 40 day, right? Okay. So now, park this aside, right? Remember 100 to zero, 40 day, we managed to achieve this. Now let's talk a little bit more about the game of Go. So the game of Go, we discovered the game of Go around 500 BC, we knew that we've actually was playing, we were playing the game of Go. Um, and so it's an old game. So it's a fair assumption for us to say that, you know, we've got about 2,500 years worth of knowledge about that game. We had 2,500 years to figure out new strategy to build school, to have students to learn about the game. So it's a long time where we can actually figure out and be the best at that game, right? Okay, now let's go back to, you know, let's try and take a, a, an approach, a, a visual approach. So let's assume that this blue bar here represents 2,500 years worth of human knowledge for a single task, right? Human knowledge is a wide, you know, we can argue between what is knowledge and things like that, but for the sake of it, let's, let's assume that, you know, we had 2,500 years worth of knowledge and practice of that game. And this, this is actually not to scale, because if I were to put some red here, which will represent 40 day, you won't see anything, right? So that's 40 years. So in 40 day, we've managed to 
build a software that no one, no human can beat ever at the game anymore. And that game, you know, we had 2,500 years worth of knowledge. So if we take this a bit further, if you bear with me, then we can say, well, if 40 days of training, if we 40 days of training, we've managed to achieve and be the best at something that we knew for 2,500 years, then if, it's, if we manage to train a software for 364 days, it'll look something like this. And that's 22,812 years worth of human knowledge. Okay? So in one sentence, that's it. So in 40 days of training, we have achieved 2,500 years worth of human knowledge. All right? So let's take this idea and like, let it sink a little bit. So this is where we're at right now. Um, and this is in the past. I think it was 2017. AlphaGo was, was there, so don't quote me on that. But, you know, we, we're already ahead of this. Um, and so this is where I'm going to segue to what we do at this tech. And, 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 and by having this view of saying, well, you know, we've managed to, to achieve that much, you know, in, in a way. But one, one last thing in terms of AlphaGo and AlphaGo Zero, because I think it's very important. And, and so most of the time we say, well, you know, we've managed to build AI that, you know, excel in recognizing cat on images. And we've actually got like 2% better than human and things like that. What's very important about that type of scenario in that case study is that, like I mentioned before, we have school in China where the student who actually go and study that game for years and try to be the best at it. With AlphaGo and AlphaGo Zero, we've created knowledge. Okay, so those software are now in, in classroom because we are studying how the software play the game. So not only we've excelled about you know, being the best at the game with a software, and we have a software that's like the best in the world and we can ever beat it. But not only that, but the software is actually playing in a way that we've never seen before. So we've created knowledge that we're now studying, right? So I think that was pretty cool. Uh, it's, it, I couldn't find any other case study where AI created knowledge. I probably didn't do much research too much on that, but uh, I thought it was interesting. So now I'm gonna segue, and if you keep this in mind, I'm gonna segue to what we do at this tech and how this could be applied to sort of any industry because, you know, like Marianne said, AI is everywhere and any industry you guys are in got to be impacted or is already impacted about it, about AI. And so, um, so this tech, so what we, what, we, what we are doing at this tech is that we are building an, an assessment app for dyslexia. And so dyslexia is not well known, to be honest. Um, autism is much more um, known. Um, and it's, dyslexia is not talked about much. Um, and I believe that the reason for this is because it's really hard to measure the impact of individuals with dyslexia on society, right? Um, and so for those who, of you who don't know what dyslexia is, it's, it's basically a learning disorder which impacts the ability of reading and most of the time, the ability of writing with a symptom called dysgraphia. Um, and it's a brain condition, so it's biologic. Um, and there's no drug that you can take that will cure you of that. It's just, there's just no way. You have to adapt. And so I'm dyslexic and dysgraphic. And so what happened when you go from kindergarten to primary school is that when you're at kindergarten, you know, your, your, your medium of learning is experience. So, you know, you do stuff, you break things and you learn from that. But when you go to primary school, um, your medium of learning become now heavily reading and writing, right? You have to read book, you have to write stuff to learn, right? And if, you, if you're dyslexic, um, your learning curve is here. And then when you go to primary school, you just flat out and then you just can't read and can't write. So it took me about two years to actually learn and read and write. And so we, we thought about, you know, building, building, um, and to check the next slide, um, we thought about building an assessment for dyslexia. And so there's many, there's many um, survey. It's very hard to actually gr have a, an idea of how many people on earth are dyslexic because obviously there's many that are undiagnosed. So roughly, some of the survey goes between 10 and 20% of the worldwide population with some degree of dyslexia. To put you in context, if we go on the biggest number, that's more than the population of China, right? So if there's any investor in there, the potential market of what we do is huge. <laughs> and so um, th there is, there is um, a lot of people with dyslexia. And so if I'm doing a comparison about knowledge and you know, bring back the AlphaGo thing, dyslexia has been discovered in, in 1881. 
that's about four, 140 years worth of us, human, trying to figure out what's going on in the brain, how can we help children test this, fail that, trial and error, blah, 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 all that sort of thing for 140 years. So there's, there's you know, there's many, um, there's been many research done on dyslexia, a lot of different publication in different areas of science. And so when you have dyslexia, there is two things that needs to happen, and those two things generally are sequential, which means that one cannot happen before the other, unless, you know, unless you've got a lot of money. And so the first thing that you need to do is you actually need to be assessed and diagnosed with dyslexia because obviously you don't know what you don't know. If you've got a kid who can't read, it could be hearing impairment, vision impairment, it is like the list is endless. So you actually need to figure out what it is that I need to do to help that child, right? So first step is assessment. Second step is, well, when you know that it's dyslexia, you then need to go through an intervention and say, well, how can I help this child, right? Because teaching the child how to read a book with a book in front of him maybe doesn't work. You actually have to try different things, right? And so what we focus at this tech and the problem that we try to solve using AI is the first one, which is the enabler. So how can we actually have assessment fast, quick, cheap, so that anyone can do it? So that the sooner we know, the earlier we can get intervention, the better it is for society, economic outcome, whatever you want to measure it in. And so, uh, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to lay out the problem of assessment in Australia. And then I'm going to walk you through how we actually use AI to, to solve um, that problem. Um, and so today, in Australia, if you have a doubt with your child and you want to go through an assessment, right, and you're calling around and you're going to get a spot and you're most likely going to wait for six months before going for a, a professional can take up to a year, okay? Cost, is it around that much, 1,500? Can, um, you know, we've talked to a lot of parents in, by doing this work and, 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 and a lot of them pay over two, two grand for the assessment. The assessment generally take four hours, there's a lot of different things. And so um, that's the current state. And the reason that is, it's not because, you know, we want to make a lot of money on parents and we, you know, we don't have, it's just that there's not, the amount of, individual needing an assessment vs the amount of people being able to provide an assessment is completely imbalanced, right? Supply and demand, basic economic, it's, it's just very, very in balance. Um, and so um, this, is, this is roughly what <laughs> all the different things that you can look at um, in terms of scientific field, theory, experimentation, things like that about dyslexia. So some people may say that, you know, dyslexic people don't know how to do their shoelace. But turns out I can. Um, and th there's all sorts of different theories. So what we did at this second was like, well, hang on. How do, we, how, how do we make this simpler? And how can we apply AI? Because as, as you guys know, you know, we need data. We actually need the digitalized data. It cannot be just a spreadsheet with some tick. It has to be digitalized. So out of all this process and assessment process, you know, we, we do things like um, you know, meaning. Do we, does the child actually understand what he read and things like that? So there's all sorts of things that we can't really measure and use for AI. However, there's two very important thing that we can measure. And I, th I think that's actually the most important one, um, apart from doing your shoelace, uh, and that's reading and writing, right? And that, they're, they're the two skills you need in order to function and be a good citizen in that society, right? If you can't do those two things, you're gonna have a big problem, okay? And so it turns out that within the assessment of dyslexia, this long process of dyslexia, we can record people reading, and we can take a photo of the handwritten text. And so that's what we did. We built an app, and this app allows us to collect the data that we need. And what we do is we're doing, um, with AI, what you need is, you know, you need the, the, the right answer and the wrong answer. So we're building a data set of children, audio recording, and photo of handwritten text, which has already been diagnosed with dyslexia, and we do the other one. We do the exact same thing with children that we're pretty sure don't have any symptom of dyslexia and you know, are properly non-dyslexic. Non and so with enough data, what you can do is you can train a neural net that will recognize and extract knowledge about what's going on when someone reads and has dyslexia and what's going on when someone reads and doesn't have dyslexia. And then what you do is you have a, an assessment, basically. 
Um, and this can be compressed into a mobile app. And so a mobile app can be used by anyone. You don't need any training. You don't need a PhD in literacy to actually get your phone out. Um, you know, have the child to read some words, take a photo of their handwritten text, and then get an assessment. Okay. Um, and actually, by doing this, that's a, that's a bit of a segue. But oh god, that emoji is terrible. Uh, yeah. Um, so in the same way, by doing this, what it turns out that you know there's a lot of a lot of people talk about evidence, and you know when you when you got your child and you know that there's a problem, and you go and you're going to spend money on in intervention with a professional, you want to make sure that the intervention that's being done on your child has some sort of evidence that well you know yes it's working, you know it's, it's you know there's public evidence that I can check, and yeah it's been working, uh, and so it turns out that with what we do with the app of collecting data, we can actually collect data before the intervention of little Johnny. And then when little Johnny go through the intervention, we can then collect the data after the intervention. And then what we can do is we can actually compare and say, well, you know, there's no improvement at all. Or, you know, yes, there is some improvement. Here's the data, here's the evidence. So we can actually generate evidence for intervention. And so if if, if today we were to release an assessment app for dyslexia, here's what it would look like. It's a 15-minute job to get an assessment of dyslexia, whether you have high chance of dyslexia or not, compared to, you know, six months' time. It's going to cost under $100 compared to $1,500. So it, these are big numbers. Like, the difference between this and this, it's like... If you do this in person, it will be probably 1,400 plus difference in terms of time. And so what I mean by this is that if, if AI can be applied to any industry, right? And, and, what's, what's, and the, that case study of, of, you know, of this tech of what we do is that we, you know, there, there is this problem here and we actually need to figure out a way to extract relevant data, then we can apply machine learning techniques to extract knowledge that no one knows and we will probably never know except when um, explainable AI is getting a bit more advanced because right now it's kind of a black box. Um, and then so I think there's three steps for the entrepreneur in the room. Uh, I'm not an expert, but you know, that's what I think is good. And I, and I hope we can have some discussion later on about that, that thought process about you know, knowledge and, and things like that. But, but I would say the first thing is to define the problem to solve. Then the big question that you need to ask yourself is, is there, is there data that I can use throughout that problem, right? And, and if there is, is that data, is, is that data actually relevant for the problem. So, for example, is it relevant for us to take a photo of the color of the shoe of the child with dyslexia? Right? It's probably not relevant at all. Um, so, it's, it, and, and that comes down to you know, ethics and, and, and bias and things like that. So, I think the, the main thing with AI is, is like, ask, are you asking yourself the right question? Right? And that's really hard. Like, you, you don't really know. Um, and actually, we did this a lot. You know, we, we, we gathering audio recording of 10 years old, 7 years old, 8 years old. There's a massive ethic thing on our shoulder saying, well, how do we actually make sure that this is as, it has as minimum bias as possible, right? And so the right question need to be, need to be asked. And then, you know, I also believe that the more people you help, the more likely you're going to be successful in a way. So, you know, if you're building an app that's going to help your neighborhood, uh, it's great, you know, probably 500 people. But if you build something that will absolutely help, you know, millions, um, then you, you, you're probably going to be much faster in terms of success. And uh, that's me. So thank you very much. And I, I, I really hope that we can get some discussion going. I can see, like, some head were doing like this. Now, what, what is he saying here? So it would be great to hear from you.